Could the stock market crash in the fourth quarter of 2023? Hey everybody, Church Burger here. Welcome to another episode of the Steady Wealth Podcast. That is the question we are going to pose today. But before we even consider this potential stock market crash scenario, let us first talk about the sort of typical seasonal tailwinds that equities and uh, risk assets in general, I think it's fair to say, tend to see in the fourth quarter. We do want to, of course, start off on a positive note. I also want to make sure that uh, it's clear that I'm not here to, to paint doom and gloom, and I'm certainly not hoping for a stock market crash. I'm just relaying our information to you so you might be able to make more informed decisions. I guess that's really my main hope. Seasonally speaking, there is a lot of tailwinds, and we discuss this all the time with our clients. And the seasonal tailwinds in the fourth quarter really have to do with flows. If we think about what is the typical fund manager going to do in the fourth quarter if they're underperforming their benchmark. Typically speaking, and we'll talk about equities here in the NASA class first or primarily, typically speaking, those fund managers will have to chase the, 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 the best performing assets for the year. So that can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy where let's say fund manager XYZ, who's running a fund that has let's say the S&P 500 as at least some sort of a benchmark mix and they're underperforming that index. Let's assume, which is typically what more fund managers than not do. They will then go ahead and start selling the losers and start buying the winners. In this case, they would be buying Nvidia this year and a few other names uh, like that. That in turn, of course, leads other market participants, let's say algorithms to, to find those flows. They will jump on the back of those. And so we have a self-fulfilling prophecy and the odds of that happening in a fourth quarter are higher than other times of the year, at least f f from a, a marking up the books perspective, because again, there is that desperate need to mark up the books, to show some sort of a performance, even if it's just window dressing in the year end, because if the performance is terrible, then that fund manager or those fund managers have a decent chance of losing their job in, in the new year. And of course, they don't want that. So that is the seasonality as it is. And I'm going to quickly just share a chart and I will show you the chart and I'll describe it here, this chart of seasonality. I think it's it's just interesting to note. And again, if you can't see this because you're listening on traditional podcast, not a problem at all. You're not missing a thing. I'm just going to quickly share it with you and then talk about this, this seasonality pattern, as well as the other few charts I, I will be showing with you. So here is seasonality. This is again, this S and P 500 seasonality. We show this chart all the time and you can see, or you would see if you were to see the chart, seasonality basically starts to improve as we head towards the uh, middle part of October. We're now well past the middle part of October, might I add. And, and then that tends to improve further in November and then ultimately even in December. So that is the typical seasonality move. Now, the danger I see this year is I have to say more than ever, and I've been doing this for a long enough period of time now, I think 25 years in total, I've, I'm noticing more than ever that people are pointing to seasonality. They're pointing to seasonality, they're pointing to margin improvement, yada, yada, yada. So first of all, let's, let's go back to seasonality before we even talk about margins and, and then all the other stuff. So from a seasonality perspective, notice that seasonality does not have to work. Like it's not a hundred percent guarantee. There are plenty of years where that seasonal tailwind does not work. Go back to 2018, for example, and so and plenty other examples. So yes, there's a strong tent and I really want to respect seasonality. Trust me, if there is a rally, I will certainly want to get part of that, but it is not a guarantee. And I'm hearing so many people talk about this as if it's a hundred percent guarantee. They talk about positioning and underweight, this, underweight, that. What they're not taking into account is the macro environment. And basically if something were to go wrong in terms of people having to liquidate, but anyway, the, but that season now that's the positive bit. And that could certainly get the S and P maybe back up to 4,600. I mean, that's in turn entirely possible. And then we'll see what January brings. Maybe then January sees the selling. I don't know, but that's the seasonal tailwinds. Again, I don't want to disrespect it, but I, I do want to point out it's a single factor input. Seasonality does not take into account where we are in the broader economic environment. It does not take that into account. So uh, what that means is that seasonality is basically an average. 
averages that have data points that overshoot that average and undershoot that average. So if we ignore where we're on the economic cycle and just look at seasonality, to me, I would argue that's a pretty risky uh, way of doing things. But again, of course, people have to learn and, and, and learn, go through that process themselves. While we're speaking about seasonality, let me talk about something else that I hear people discuss here, and that's margin improvement. <laughs> Let's take, for example, an industrial stock like Deer or Caterpillar. They are, I think, at the moment at record margins, record profit margins. Their ability to finance themselves at a, at a cheaper rate has gone out the window because rates have gone straight up, as well as their ability to pass along those increased costs to people is going to become an increasing problem because people are slowly but surely, again, having rates by see the putting pressure on their own margins. So the odds of Caterpillar and industrial stocks and then many other stocks to further improve the margin here are extremely slim to potentially somewhere closer to none. So if you hear people talk about margin improvements, that's probably not going to happen. So that's a couple things. Now, let's talk about a few other points that I want to talk about in terms of where we are as far as the yield curve goes. And I realize right now, probably some of you just tuned out because you don't want to hear the word yield term, um, uh, uh, yield curve, but let me just quickly uh, go through that nonetheless. So what I'd like to describe to you is a scenario where the yield curve is re-steepening. So what does that mean in English? So for the past I don't know, a year and a half or something like that, we have seen the yield curve invert. So that means that the yield of the longer term duration treasuries uh, are yielding less than the short term treasuries. And uh, we got to the point where we saw an inversion of minus 1%, minus 100 basis points between the two year yield being 100 basis points higher than the 10 year yield at some point this summer. We've now since then, ricocheted back to the point where right now we have a re-steepening of the yield curve to the tune of minus 15 basis points, 0.15%. So put that into perspective. We had a yield curve that was inverted to the tune of minus 100 basis points. It's now back to only just minus 15. That's, I'm going to call that almost a flat-ish yield curve, dare I say. Keep that in mind. Now, if we look back at history, and again, if you're watching this on YouTube or, or somewhere where you can see the video, you'll see this chart, but I'll describe it to you. Typically speaking, when the yield curve starts to re-steepen, that is typically when the equity market, which on the chart, if you can see it, is, is, is a blue line, is typically when the equity market, S&P 500 terms, starts to really get into ser more serious trouble. So what that essentially means is that the real part of the bear market or at least the resumption of the bear market, the maybe the more nasty part where people actually do start to feel it or at least become consciously aware of it, which is in my next point in just a second on the next uh, description of the chart, that is typically when people start to uh, freak out and things go from bad to worse. So long story short, the re-steepening of the yield curve is right now happening. It's been happening for several months and it is at this exact juncture where typically speaking, the S&P 500 or stocks start to go and in, get into more trouble. You couple that with the fact that just even last week, we had Chair Powell start to sound a little more, dare I say, dovish, not that he's going to start cutting rates, but the first step for the Fed to start cutting rates is their acknowledgement that maybe rates are high enough for the time being. So basically stopping rate hikes or at least pausing. I think we've reached that point. So we've got basically three things checking. All three things that we need checking. Number one, the yield curve is re-steepening. Number two, the Fed is acknowledging that maybe they, you know, they're we're about where they need to be in terms of rate hikes. And thirdly, the economy is slowing. We, we've talked about all these things for now longer than I care to even admit that I have because it's been way too early for me to even talk about this even a year ago. But we have the consumer slowing. There's no doubt about it. We've seen resumption of the student uh, debt repayments, interest rates are biting. So all these things are happening. It's not that they're not happening. It's just that we had a crazy amount of stimulus uh, not since World War One and Two, in relative terms have we had stimulus that we had during the pandemic. And that just takes everything uh, longer to play out. Now, in terms of people not being aware of how the portfolio, how their portfolios are doing or not caring, uh, and the latter matter of the latter fact would be even more concerning to me. Let's talk a little bit about where things are. I still think a lot of self-directed investors 
are simply not either not aware or they don't yet care that they have not made money for the past two years. And if they have made money, they're in a minority. I can guarantee you that because they were basically holding a few tech stocks. And here is a way to look at this. Now, again, I'm going to describe this very simple chart. Apple for the past two years. So this is October, 2021 to October, 2023. Apple is up, let's call it 17 and a half percent. The S and P 500 in that same period over two years is down 3.63%. You add an inflation on top of that, and you've got an S&P, a, a money losing proposition to the tune of probably closer to minus 15%. So if someone who's in S&P 500 allocations, which most Americans are way over allocated to the S&P 500 at this juncture in the economic cycle, those people are now down 15%, not 3.6 like the S&P, but more like 15. So with Apple, they're, they're maybe up just 2%. The NASDAQ 100 that everyone is talking about is so amazing is now down 4.3%, okay? In real terms, uh, if you take in, uh, in nominal terms, if you take in uh, inflation into account, of course, it's down a lot more, but let's talk about nominal terms. S&P down 3.6, NASDAQ minus 4.3. Consumer discretionary stocks, just to throw in a couple, I can just throw in many worse, are down 20% in two years, okay? Again, you throw in inflation on top of that, you're down 30, 35. So it very quickly starts to look a lot uglier than people think. Then I like to use our proprietary algorithm. It's the market rover. If you're an inner circle member, you know what that is. One of the things that we like to do, we like to track the, the sectors and many other asset classes around the world. But in this case, let's talk about the sectors of the S and P 500. Unlike popular opinion on some financial TV stations, the S and P 500 currently by our math only has three sectors that are bullish, what we call trend, bullish trend. One of them is energy. I think that's clear tech. So the XLK ETF is still bullish trend, but it's slowly starting to wane. Nvidia is a concern right now and communications, the XLC ETF, which by the way, that is technology stocks as well, just so you know. So we've got three sectors that are bullish. I think energy to me, certainly by far the favorite one. Then you have four or uh, five sectors, excuse me, that are neutral trend. And this, they just recently flipped from bullish back to neutral trend. So they were bullish. Now they're neutral. That is sectors like industrial stocks, financial stocks, and consumer discretionary stocks have had bullish trends at some point this year. They're now no longer bullish. They're now neutral trend. This all happened just over the past two weeks. So this is not like people are now getting ready to ramp stocks higher in the year end. They could still do it if they get lucky, but so far trends are getting worse, not better. So let's talk about that as well. And then you've got bearish trends, outright bearish trends. You've got utilities, which look like death because they are, of course, basically bond proxies, which could ultimately turn around if things get worse in the fourth quarter. Real estate bond proxies as well in that case, and consumer staple stocks have been bearish trend for 22 days. So that doesn't bode well either. Then uh, we can look at the technicals and you know, there's a lot of ways to draw lines, but let me start off with the German DAX. I know a lot of you guys didn't, couldn't care less about the German DAX. The German DAX matters. Let me just uh, break that news to you. The German DAX currently looks like it wants to go plenty lower. And that is a real concern. It's a real concern, not just for German investors, but for global investors, because the German DAX is actually a little bit more sensitive to global macroeconomic data than let's say the S&P 500 because it doesn't really have a tech sector, or certainly not as much as the, certainly not as much as the, the, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100. So uh, that's important to, to be aware of, uh, the German DAX, uh, I don't want to give you a number too much here, but I think 14,000 would not be out of the realm of possibilities in the not too distant future. So you, you take all these things together and, um, mathematically it's getting more and more difficult for, uh, the S and P 500 to start to string together something positive. Let me give you a couple more, let's say six month data points. So on a, through a six month data lens, as much as technology was, was saving the day, the S and P 500 now is up 2.4% for the past six months. Consumer discretionary is up a little bit. Apple's up a little bit. And the NASDAQ 100 is still up 11.5%. That's again, we all know just due to a few stocks and industrial stocks are down. If we zoom in on the past three months, everything is down over the past three months. So things have not gotten better 
they've gotten worse over the past three months. That's because economic data has gotten worse. We have, unfortunately, some awful news out there with geopolitical tension around uh, several sp spots around the world. That's not helping. So the S&P over the past three months, let's be clear, is down 7%. The NASDAQ 100 is down 8% past three months. Industrials are down 10. Apple is down 11. XLY, that's consumer discretionary, is down 15%. Now, none of this means that we can't see a lift at some point in the fourth quarter, but the weight of evidence, as far as I'm concerned, is getting more and more towards a more difficult time here for the bulls for the remainder of the fourth quarter. We have earnings season here and tech earnings are going to come out and that will be important. So we look at the stocks like Nvidia, for example, right now, which unless they start to get some good news real soon, then we might be in a situation where the few stocks that were holding up the S and P 500 would would probably more than anything start to start to to weigh on the S and P 500 even more, which in turn would get things a lot lower. So Nvidia, if it doesn't hold the current levels here, as I'm recording this around 410, I would not at all be surprised if we see 350 before too long. That may not seem like a big move, but it's going to be a problem for a lot of algorithms, and that. Um, 350 move in, in sort of percentage terms is about 14% from where I'm recording this right now. It would cause plenty of technical damage. It would cause people to sell and forced selling begets more forced selling. And that's my point, right? Listen, technology might as well come in and save the day. It's entirely possible still. We have seasonal tailwinds. I get all that. However, think about order flows. As much as order flow is the near-term stuff that saves the day typically on the bullish side or deteriorates things on the bearish side, we need to, like I just said, see both sides. So on the bullish side, we know that as I started the webinar with, if we see bullish order flows, that can lead other algorithms to jump on the back of that. Other investors see little bullish reversals and before you know it, we were breaking out. That's exactly what happened this spring, by the way. NVIDIA led all this off with their blowout earnings in May. That got fund managers to chase through May, June, and into July. And since then, these stocks have all peaked and gone lower for the most part. But let's respect the opposite side as well. It is entirely feasible to, to have an outcome where things get worse and people will be forced to sell. They want to save their gains. Let's think about that. So I'm, I get the chart chasing part. I get the, the performance anxiety. Trust me, I, I preach it all the time in the fourth quarter. But at this juncture in the economic environment, let's also respect what may happen if that doesn't happen. Maybe if people, what if people want to lock in their profits in NVIDIA for the year? What if they want to do that? Then they will close their position in NVIDIA. That would have a chain effect and stock market, stocks, algorithms, and, and traders are going to sell all sorts of other positions just to square their books. So that could happen as well. And that could lead to a gnarly potential quote unquote crash in the fourth quarter. Again, it's not my 100% forecast, nothing 100%. I just want people to think in terms of rewards of risk, uh, reward and risk in terms of pr probabilities and think in terms of possibilities, because we do not have to have a fourth quarter rally. We can also skip a fourth quarter rally this year and maybe even go in the opposite direction. So keep an open mind, hope it helps folks. And we'll see you in the next. Study Wealth Podcast.